This is the second half of the Cell Structures podcasts. Uh, the first two parts were on eukaryotes, or sorry, on prokaryotes, and so this next section is going to be on eukaryotic cells. <clears throat> uh, just a quick review here first. Our prokaryotic cells that we talked about in the last two podcasts um, are almost always single-celled, unless it's a colony of them living together. They reproduce by binary, binary fission, which we talked about. Uh, they don't have a nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles. The DNA just kind of floats around the cell. And all bacteria are prokaryotes. You may want to list some of these characteristics in your notebook so that you've got a good handle on what prokaryotic cells are before we move on to the eukaryotic cells. The eukaryotic cells, which is going to be what this podcast focuses on, are most of the other organisms that are living on the planet. So everything you can see from plants to animals, fungi, um, protists, all are eukaryotic cells. They can be single-celled, like oftentimes protists, like amoebas and paramecium are single-celled, or multicellular like we are. Uh, they reproduce in one of several ways, could be meiosis, could be mitosis. It's not binary fission though, binary fission is specific to the prokaryotic cells. They do have a nucleus uh, to kind of package up the DNA and also other um, structures that have membranes around them as well. So on to the eukaryotes. The U part of eukaryotic actually means true nucleus. Again, this is not something probably you have to write down, but just for further reference, we already discussed how the genetic material, the DNA or RNA, is in a nuclear membrane. So we call that the nucleus. Um, they have other cell parts or organelles that have membranes around them. And it is believed that they actually evolved from prokaryotic cells. So the prokaryotic cells are the simpler versions. And then the eukaryotic cells you know, showed up later. This stuff, you, again, don't need to write down, but just an overview for your own purposes. This is where we need to start getting some information into your notebooks. I'm going to go through the different parts of a eukaryotic cell, and they are more complicated than the prokaryotic cells, so we have quite a few parts we need to get through. Uh, the first is the cytoplasm. We did talk about cytoplasm in a bacterial cell or a prokaryotic cell, um, which is kind of similar, except because there's all these organelles in it, it does have some differences. Uh, you can think of it as a soup or a chowder. Right, so it's liquid with solid things floating around with it. The organelles are the solid chunks of the soup, the vegetables or the meat or whatever, and then the cytosol is the liquid part. Uh, the cytosol, the liquid part, has all sorts of different stuff in it. It has water in it, salts, um, organic molecules, so we're talking carbs, proteins, lipids, things like that, and also lots of enzymes that help reactions to happen in the cytoplasm. Next structure is the cytoskeleton. Again, we talked about this a little bit with prokaryotic cells. But it's a little more complicated in eukaryotic cells. It does help to maintain the cell shape, protects the, shell, the cell, um, has some movement involved with it. Um, for example, flagella and cilia are extensions of the cytoskeleton to help move the cell around. Also helps to move things within the cell itself, so vesicles and other cell parts kind of move like on little tracks of the cytoskeleton. And then finally it helps the cell to divide. So we're going to go through all of these different functions here and talk about specifically what structures in the cytoskeleton make these functions happen. The first three parts are the um, protein threads essentially of the cytoskeleton. Uh, crisscrossing through the cell, again kind of like a skeleton or you think of it like a spider web um, crisscrossing through the cytoplasm of the cell. There are the microfilaments, the intermediate filaments, and the microtubules. So the microfilaments, um, you don't need to know so much of what they are. I mean, you don't have to write it down, but basically it's a protein, two strands twined together. What's more important is up here um, next after the description of it, it says they help the cell to maintain its shape. So that's one function of the microfilaments. Um, they help to bear against tension, so against pulling and stretching. 
So they help the cell to resist that. Uh, they help to make what are called the microvilli in your small intestine, which are little bumps in your small intestine uh, where there's lots of blood vessels to help absorb nutrients. They are in your muscle cells to help with contraction. They're also in cells like amoeba that are single-celled organisms that kind of need to move around on their own. So they help the amoeba to move uh, through its environment. So lots of different things those microfilaments are used for. <clears throat> the intermediate filaments, the next one down, are again fibrous proteins coiled into thick cables. Again, not so much that you know what they are, but second part again, what do they do? They also help with the shape of the cell. They help for anchoring organelles, so organelles like the nucleus that need to stay in place. They actually create kind of like a web um, or a cage around the nucleus to kind of hold it into place. They also found in the axons of your nerve cells. Axons are like long arms that stretch out from the nerve cells so one uh, neuron can communicate with another one. And again, those need to be super strong, and so they are made of intermediate filaments. The third one, the microtubules, made of a protein called tubulin, and they are hollow tubes. What do they do? Again, the important things, cell shape, cell movement, they move the chromosomes around during cell division. They also create these little highways uh, which certain organelles that need to move around the cell can travel. So uh, vesicles, for example, move around the cell from inside and outside, and they hop onto a microtubule and travel throughout the cell. The last thing microtubules can do is work together or alone to create these cilia, flagella, or centrioles. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So microtubules get a little more complicated. We're going to move on to their function in the next couple slides here. Oh, went one too far. I think, yeah, this is the one we want. There we go. Okay, so first of all, as I said, the microtubules can make these centrioles or centrosomes. Um, so the centrosome is kind of the, the bigger area in the cell, and you can see that right here. Let me point that out. So here's a centrosome. It's a bigger structure. Each centrosome is made of two centrioles. And what those centrioles do is they help the cell to divide. Okay? So essentially, I mean, if you don't want to write this word for word, which I wouldn't because it's kind of wordy, the centrosome is an area where you find two centrioles, and the centrioles help the cell to divide. And again, they're all made out of microtubules, and that's the reason we're talking about them now. So down at the bottom is a nice little flow chart here that put a bunch of microtubules together, you get a centriole, 